let's talk mental health, how important it is. Well, my next guest is a trauma specialist who has AUDHD. We're going to learn about her and her practice and how important mental health is to everybody. So sit back, relax, and grab your favorite beverage, and I'll see you on the other side. See you there. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Inside the Asperger Studios. Today, I'm joined with Bethia. Welcome to the show, Bethia. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. And I always like to start off the show with, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, my name is Bethia Capola Rios, and I've been in the mental health field for almost 30 years. I have a master's degree. I'm licensed as a professional counselor, national certification, I'm a supervisor, and I also work a lot with trauma. Um, and I'm a uh, certified clinical trauma professional. And I love what I do. I cannot imagine doing anything else. I've worked all different levels of care, all the way down to inpatient. But being in private practice and meeting clients one-on-one -on -one and watching that therapeutic relationship change their lives and seeing the fruit of the of our labor, it's, it's very rewarding. How did you get into being a trauma therapist? kind of just evolved that way. Um, I saw that there was, there were a lot of clients coming through that had trauma and it always interested me to work with that. And right now I'm actually working on a certification for EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing and very, very effective, very helpful. And uh, it's also helpful for people who have Audi HD like me, where we feel things big, like all of our emotions are big. And sometimes those emotions get attached to a memory that's very upsetting for us. So we can actually go in and reprogram that memory. All right. When were you diagnosed with your ADHD and your ASD? So when I was a kid, I think I was maybe first or second grade, um, I went to private school and the nuns would say that Bethia can't have sugar during the week because she gets too wild. You know, that's kind of funny you mentioned that. When I was in high school, I, mm -hmm. I was off of, I think, my meds at the time and I was working at stage crew. And one of the things they told me is to avoid sugar. My mom was like, you need to avoid sugar at this time. And I used, and I would tell the guys that I was working with, make sure I don't get any sugar. Because it, he's like, why? I'm like, well, it makes me very hyper. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'll make sure you'll eat, but, you, but uh, I'll also make sure you don't have any sugar in it. No sugar, yep. so I'll keep an eye on you. So I had good, I had a good set of friends when I was working stage crew that kept an eye on me, made sure I ate, made sure I didn't have any sugar in my diet. So that's funny you mentioned that because that's the first time I've heard other people with that same thing. You know, it had to be right on the cusp, 79, 1980 maybe. And these were nuns that were just saying, hey, she gets really hyper when she has sugar. Uh, so that was the extent of my diagnosis as a child that she's hyper, she has ADHD. I excelled academically as most young women do and they go undiagnosed because many of us, we do excel academically and we don't stand out. We put our head down, we learn to mask at a very young age and just to make it through this neurotypical world. All right. Now, how does having AUDHD affect your work? Well, I do want to back up a little to tell you that 
I wasn't di formally diagnosed. When pandemic hit, my entire business was moved to my dining room and we never slowed down. So we went through 2020 and towards the end of 2020, I, I said to my doctor, like, I don't feel right. My meds aren't working. I had actually been on an ADHD med because I told them that I had ADHD and they believed me, thank God. So during pandemic, because of all of that added pressure and all of the crisis going on and what happened was I got to the point where I said, something's wrong and it's not, it's not just the ADHD or it's not just the trauma work that I'm doing. Something's off. And of course, insurances don't pay for neuropsyche valves. So I ended up, um, this is awful. I ended up going um, to a private neuropsychologist paying almost $4,000 oh. to get a full, a full workup of um, cognitive tests and all it, what it really did, I was in crisis, but what it really did was just validate that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. You have ADHD and autism and for the ladies out there, perimenopause makes ADHD symptoms worse. Mm. And I was right in that cusp. I was 40, 46, I think, when, when pandemic hit and I'm grateful that I had the, I, I'm grateful I had the resources. Not everybody has, who can afford to shell out 4,000 to something that's not even covered by insurance. And to be honest, I didn't have it. I didn't have it in cash. Mm -hmm. I, I put on a card, but it was worth the investment to me. I, that's why I think that we should make neuropsych testing routine for all students who enter the school all of them and catch it early so that they don't have to suffer like we suffered true i mean everyone i've talked to lately their kids have been diagnosed early on in life either either at two years old or or a little bit older i mean that's when everyone should have been diagnosed but yeah no one knew of autism back then i mean when i was diagnosed in my 20s by family and stuff the um the state didn't even recognize autism so my mom's like we're not going to try anything for to get you on ssi because autism is still a new thing we're going to wait until it's it gets registered so we waited a while and then i mean we go we go for the whole process of applying and it just gets denied because they don't want to approve it. They don't want to give you the money because they say, "Oh, he's still capable of working a menial menial labor." So finally, mm -hmm. we got a lawyer, a disability lawyer, and she's like, "Listen, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to deny you again, but this mm -hmm. time you're going to flip it on them, and you're going to, in the back of it, you're going to, re it's going to say you're going to appeal with a, with a court case, with a with a lawyer." So we did, we got our court case, met the lawyer. She, we talked before I met the judge. We went in front of the judge and then you get, and then there's a woman from the occupational therapy, but a vocational therapy who tries to find out all these different types of jobs. And every one of them, my mom's like, nope, he works with people there. You work with people there. And so afterwards, the judge thanks us, we go and then maybe a couple of months later, I get a letter saying, congratulations, you're awarded full credit. Hmm. Despite the only thing I didn't get was my back pay. Nuh -uh. Mm hmm Because they say I still had life insurance money of 2000, a little over 2000 dollars in life insurance. And what happened was I had to sign it over to my brother who, and still they wouldn't do it. 
and we talked with a family friend who's a lawyer and she's like my mom's like is it worth fighting she's like nope you don't want to open the can of worms because they can go digging into your life mm-hmm. it's just that little book mm-hmm. getting what i'm getting yeah mm-hmm. so the message to everyone out there is if you can't get on SSI right away, get yourself a disability lawyer. Yes. And also don't give up. Moms, I talk to a lot of moms on TikTok and they're so they they feel defeated because nobody's listening and let me tell you, nobody knows your kid better than you. Nobody. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I think that there should be some accountability for these schools that turn us down for services when we're when we end up being right. Anyway, because they don't want to do the work. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about mental health. Yes. Why do you think mental health is so important? Oh my gosh, relationships. Mental health is important because it affects everything we do. It, our mental health affects how we communicate, whether that's communicating with family members or employers, um, everyday things like going to the quick jack, like you have to interact with people. And a lot of what we do is helping people to identify where that that area is that they need to work on um, you know, with when I work with adults who are also out EHD, a lot of what we do is just education. It really is that validation of, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. There's that you felt odd because boom, boom, boom. These are the these are the characteristics. I don't. I try not to call them symptoms because I'm not sick. It's who I am. And if, if a person is if a person is coming to therapy and they're wanting to learn about who they are, why would I make them feel badly about who they are? Now what can people do to stay on top of their mental health? Um of course I want to say 100 percent go get a good therapist. And I really mean get a good one. Not everybody needs therapy. I do think that nutrition is very important. We're seeing more and more research that is telling us how important gut health is and how it can affect our mental health. So I really, I think nutrition, exercise, um, not that I do either of those. But, but also, um, exercise, a good therapist. Some of us need meds, not all of us. No. Now, do you treat those who have ASD? Can you say it again? Do you treat those who have ASD? Well, um, if you mean treat like educate, yes. Again, if if someone comes and they're not understanding why they're having difficulty communicating, I, I'm going to provide them with education and help them process through the emotions that come up with from, not from that knowledge. Um, a lot of it, though, is helping them to accept themselves. And re- remove that stigma that something's wrong with them. All right. What is a typical day like for you? I I am go, go, go. From, I always have difficulty waking up. However, I'm to the office by seven. I'm here until eight or nine at night. Um. I see clients. I'm also running a business. I built my practice. And remember, undiagnosed, I started building my practice in 2008. And uh, now I have 20 providers. Um, 
I have a prescriber. Uh, we offer so many services to the community. And again, all done before I even knew that I had ADHD. All right. So I guess I had just figured out how to make it work for me. That's how my brain works. So that's, and I just went with that. All right. And what is your approach when you deal with a client who's got depression? Every client's different. I, so I, I can't say to you that um, there's, only, there's one way to treat someone with depression. I, I, you know, Reed, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I think for me, what makes me a good therapist is that I do connect with them. Connecting with them, letting them know that they're not just another number. They're not, I don't see dollar signs when I look at them. I see a human being who's in pain. And so I treat them, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll recommend that they see a doctor for meds if, if it's really bad. But a lot of times they just need to process whatever it is that's going on in their lives. No. Do you think there there are certain things that trigger our anxiety or depression? Yes, the unknown. If you if you think about when we are anxious, when we're nervous, it's because we don't know what's about to happen or there are there are facts that are missing. So what happens is the anxiety comes down like the root of a tree and it holds on to those unknowns if we can replace the unknowns with facts the root of the anxiety has nothing to hold on to so by replacing unknowns with facts you can get some relief from your anxiety all right what are some of the negative stigmas behind mental health the negative stigmas. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't, I don't like the C word, which is crazy. I, I tell my clients, please don't use that word because it's got such a negative stigma to it. Uh, when they're it, like, when they describe themselves as crazy, I'm like, nope, nope. I'll actually say, let, let's stop one second. You know, um, I, I think, and again, a lot of ignorance out there, a lot of miseducation uneducated and people don't realize that you already know several people who have depression so judging them will make your circle very very small um no. how did you go about choosing your providers my provider your providers the people that work for you Oh, you know, so I started out as a one woman show and there was a doctor that wanted to try private practice. So I'm like, listen, I'll run yours. I ended up running her practice and growing it into an amazing practice. I asked my best friend to join. Um, and then as I went along, I really, I really, um, vetted each person to to make sure that they believe the same things that I believe in that mental health can be done better and we as mental health professionals don't have to work in a horribly emotionally abusive environment like a lot of these institutions have hospitals and even and even nonprofits they're not the greatest places to work um we often we get criticized and dismissed and put down and we're not valued or or the the, the administration doesn't show the appreciation to to the mental health provider so knowing that i've created a practice where all of my providers know that they are appreciated, know that they are valued, 
we go to lunch or dinner every mm -hmm. couple months. I meet with every single provider every couple months just to break bread and see how they're doing. Do they need anything? It's a, uh, I've, I'm really proud of what I built. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Thank you. Uh, how did your practice um, do during the pandemic? So originally, I wasn't sure what to expect, but my practice actually maintained. Um, I I maintained all of my providers. Nobody left. And I think maybe a year and a half in, I added someone. So we actually did grow. All right. What advice, right, what advice can you give to those dealing with mental health issues? Get a good therapist. Don't be afraid. Um, you know, it, what's a really great read since we were kids? When we were kids, everybody was like, oh my God, they have a therapist. Now I have to tell the kids not to check in when they're in the lobby because they'll be like checking in at Be Well. And <laughs> I'm just saying to them like, you know, you could have some privacy if you want. They're like, oh no. Nah. Everybody's got a therapist. So get a therapist. Don't don't make it such a um, scary thing because it's really not, but you got to get a good therapist. All right. What are some of the signs people should look for when dealing with depression? Mm, change in sleep. That's a huge one. Change in sleep and also change in appetite, whether you get too much appetite or no appetite. If you have that symptom just standing by itself, okay, that could be anything. When you start adding these symptoms together though, that's when it starts to form a picture of depression. A lot of times you'll see isolation. Mm. Um, you might stop enjoying the things that you used to enjoy. Mm. I know that though, I know that very much. After my father had died, um, I went. I didn't talk to anybody until my mom suggested I do. Started mm -hmm. talking with a life coach, and then all of a sudden one day, I'm just sitting there watching YouTube videos, and I realized I have no enjoyment. I'm not feeling anything. I'm not doing the things I enjoy. I used to enjoy doing, and mm -hmm. I started to look up signs of depression. I'm like, holy crap though i am showing signs of depression mm -hmm. I'm like and i'm like you know what my dad wouldn't want me to be like this he would want me to be happy he knows that i know he's around he's always around mm -hmm. so i said i'm gonna break this i'm gonna break out of this and i started doing the getting back into the things i enjoyed and right. it's all of a sudden a cloud just lifted and i felt more enjoyment in my life. And the one message I have to tell those out there is you can do it too. I know it's hard. It's a hard mm -hmm. road to break out of depression, but get back into the things you love to do. If you don't feel any joy in it at first, keep doing it until you feel that joy all over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's tough. And the darkness that comes with depression sometimes can feel very heavy. Like mm -hmm. you feel like you just can't keep going on, mm -hmm. but it passes. And, and it's important that you put the effort in and, and the work therapy is hard. It is. If you walk out of a therapy session thinking, whew, that was easy. You're not doing it right. And you need a new therapist. Um, you got to do the hard work. And when you get that relief, you'll know that you earned it. Yeah. Now, how do you deal with people with their anxiety? Because I know that's a tough one. There are all different. Um, there are all different approaches to anxiety before you get to medication. Hello. Okay, so um,
All right, go on. Okay. Um, so there are all different approaches for anxiety. Uh, I think that medication should be used sparingly mm -hmm. because it is a lot of these meds are addictive. Mm. So it is important to get a therapist on board who knows different ways to help with that. I like journaling for that because journaling, you don't even have to write clearly. You don't even have to write coherent sentences. It's all about mucking the stall mm -hmm. of all the crap you've been stuffing. It's like, um, I read somewhere somebody said the best time to journal is like first thing in the morning, just write whatever comes to your head. And the first thing in the evening before you go to bed, just write every thought that's in your head and just, mm -hmm. just even care about if it makes sense or not, just write it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another great idea end of the day is to write down five things you're grateful for that day. And mm -hmm. finally... How can people find out more about you and your practice? Well, um, we are located in South Plainfield, New Jersey, and our website is www.bewellnj.com. And we really are trying to do mental health better. Changing the experience one client at a time. And that's it, everyone. That was Bafia Cupola Rios, and I'll see you on the next one. See you there.